our independence, our being different, uh, feisty and hard hitting and uh, creative and courageous and coming up with new ideas. That's what we're all about. And that's what we want to continue to be about. So Dan grew up uh, during the uh, Great Depression and uh, his great memory was uh, people in suits, men in suits selling apples. And uh, he also remembered uh, being in uh, grade school in uh, Manhattan and uh, having to share a seat with another kid. He's, he said, I only had half a cheek on the seat and he never wanted to have that in his grown up life. He uh, always typed things, even when he had the mumps and was isolated, he would type messages and slip them under the door. <laughs> so always a communicator. It was uh, 1942 and uh, he was a journalist in Poughkeepsie, New York and uh, he was drafted and he was put into uh, a unit uh, initially for engineering, which he said, I'm not good in math. <laughs> And uh, then he was switched over to uh, psychological warfare, went over to uh, London, um, preparing uh, for the invasion D-Day, and uh, then went over to France uh, two months after D-Day and proceeded with the American army through to Germany. Dan's uh, evenings uh, were spent listening to Nazi broadcasts, emigre, um, who had fled Germany, um, often Jewish, and um, they would translate for Dan, and uh, he would say that this is what they're saying, the Germans, and this is what we should say back. Um, and he had to have a report on the general's desk every morning at uh, 7 a.m. So he didn't see the light of day for four years. He went on to Nuremberg, where he was Allied forces observing uh, the trial and would report um, back to the Allied command what was the sentiment of the Germans about the trial. When my dad founded Edelman in 1952, Chicago was a very important part of the founding of Edelman. He started in the merchandise mart, a little small office with maybe four people. And his philosophy was, I wanna do great work for clients and then my reputation will grow. We all learned so much from him. He was as interested in the business of the business and the client opportunities and what we were doing for them and how we were approaching the pitches as he was who was gonna be on our softball team for the year. <laughs> Did we have some good talent? My parents were really legends in the city of Chicago. They are the only couple in the city of Chicago to have street signs named after both of them. My parents were very involved in the culture, politics, the business, the society. My father was uh, on the board of directors of the Lyric Opera. He was on the board of directors of the Chicago Symphony. My mother was the women's board of the Art Institute of Chicago. Dan was a completely amazing man in the industry, known by everyone. My grandfather loved Edelman and he loved to work. And when, you know, we would see him during vacation time, so it would be on th around Thanksgiving, it would be in August for vacation, and he wanted to talk about Edelman, teach us about Edelman. And so that was our first introduction to the business was with him. My grandfather was one of the most disciplined, hardworking, ethical people I know. My father and I worked together for 35 years. It was um, a relationship like no other because he wanted to pass along to me all of his wisdom. He also wanted me to uh, skin my knees. Sometimes would write in yellow pen, is that really an idea? <laughs> um, but he was tough. One of my favorite memories of Dan is when we went to Gallo Winery. So I'm driving Dan to um, the valley uh, to have this meeting. Ernest at that point was probably in his 90s. Dan was in his 80s. I was witnessing this extraordinary moment with these two who'd known each other for decades from when Dan worked on the California Wine uh, Commission. It was endearing and hysterical because these two gentlemen who were in the, you know, sort of the twilight of their years were still engaged in business and talking business. Um, I remember going to camp um, as a kid and I went to a camp up in Maine and my grandfather had also gone to sleepaway camp and loved it. Um, so when I was at camp, I remember getting letters from him that he had dictated to his secretary 
um, and they would recount his times at Brant Lake Camp and how much he loved being at camp, how he had gone from being a little kid at camp all the way up to being a camp counselor. Now he hoped I was having as wonderful a time as he had had. Danagrams were very direct, explicit instruction, direct follow-up, and there was an expectation of acknowledgement. So if you received a danagram, you had to reply in kind. You know, you'd, you'd actually get a sheaf of papers because he talked into his dictaphone and got the, the poor assistant for him. But that was his way of touching people uh, in a very tangible way. And then he would have files and follow up to make sure that they did it. And I remember getting one that was 12 pages long, single spaced. And it started with, I on a flight to China. And that's when I knew it was gonna be long. I know there's people like me all over Edelman who had a chance to work with Dan, who still walk around every day with their notebook wherever we go from meeting to meeting. You rarely would find somebody walking into a meeting without a notebook, and that's because Dan was a note taker. The note taker was the re recorded the meeting, framed it in, in a recap note, and therefore advanced the work. My parents were partners. They were a team. My mother was the heart and intuition and creativity, and my father was disciplined and smart and hardworking. They both were hardworking. Every year at Thanksgiving, we would all get together and have a sort of pre-board meeting before we could eat. And you know, I'd be a young kid, 10 years old, wanting to eat, I'd be hungry, and he would look me in the eye and say, Amanda, we're not done yet. My mother was the uh, personality, and so they would go together to parties, and uh, she would be like the advance man. And I actually went to a party and watched her go to Henry Kissinger and drag him over to my father, saying, you have to meet this most interesting man. My grandmother was the warmest, most social, energizing person that I've ever been around, and I think I know where my dad gets it, I know where my sisters and I get it as well. Well, my mom actually um, was always quite active and when she had change of life in her mid-40s she contracted manic depressive illness. My mom was a uh, big advocate for mental health funding from the government. It hadn't been a disease before uh, she went to DC with uh, actor Rod Steiger and Richard Dreyfuss and you know it was something that you covered up before. Ruth had a strong interest in mental health issues and so she would call me from time to time to help with something regarding congressional action on mental health funding, uh, mental health uh, access legislation. She put a lot of her free time into it and she would ask if we could contribute to that. We were, there was a dinner meeting at the Edelman's home and I happened to mention that the next week we were going to be pitching the Quaker Oats business. And Ruth said to me at the end of the dinner, well, I will be baking my famous oatmeal cookies. Day of the pitch, she showed up in the office with a big tin of homemade oatmeal cookies and we won the business. I would like to believe we won because of our brilliant proposal, but if you don't think the CEO's wife baking Quaker Oats oatmeal cookies tipped us over the top. <laughs> You're wrong. The cookies were incredible. 